this week, Patrick Mahomes is actively trying to ruin Josh Allen's legacy. And we got the man, Dan Lanning, in the building, head coach for the Oregon Ducks. And we got to talk about Sports Illustrated. People thought it died this week, but it's been dead for a very long time. And also, why Jason Kelsey is unafraid. Welcome to the Unafraid Show. I'm happy that you guys are here. Make sure that you like, subscribe, tell a friend about the show, and share it the way we can keep bringing you great content. It's time for the Unafraid Show. Let's go. After the Bills' three-point loss to the Chiefs, are you starting to feel sorry for Josh Allen? I Actually, nah, because you can't feel sorry for a $300 million man for stuff that happens on the field, right? And I'll get back to that in a second. Because it was a great week of football with the divisional round of the playoffs giving us an NFC championship matchup of the Detroit Lions at San Francisco. And in the AFC, we got the Chiefs who are set up to visit Baltimore. And it is going to be a rough week for people who are sick and tired of sports writers making references to the wire or people losing their minds over between play shots of Taylor Swift. And side note, why are people so mad about the camera cutting toward the biggest pop star in the world, but y'all ain't mad about about Fox or CBS or Peacock showing Jerry Jones 800 times a game. Now you need to tap into the Unafraid Show because I've already made videos about the rise of the Lions, Lamar Jackson's 10 month path from trade demand to MVP and why the Brock Purdy hype is driving me insane. And I'll link all those videos in the comments. But today we need to talk about Patrick Mahomes and the number that he's doing on Josh Allen's career. Cause this is three of the last four years that Josh Allen has seen his postseason come to an end at the hands of Patrick Mahomes. Unfortunately for Allen, this has become the foundation of his legacy so far. Cause people have officially stopped caring about the fact that he has won a playoff game for four years in a row. The dude has 27 playoff touchdowns by age 27. Doesn't matter. 0-3 against Mahomes in the playoffs. You know what this reminds me of? It, did you know that there's an 11-time NBA All-Star, two-time MVP with career averages of 26 points and 16 rebounds a game that nobody talks about? And the reason why nobody talks about him is because Bill Russell knocked him out of the playoffs three times and Wilt Chamberlain got him once too? If you don't know who it is by now, maybe you don't know basketball like that, or maybe you are a student of history, but history is written by the victors. And it's trivia time here, because if you do know who I'm talking about, drop the name in the comments. But back to my point though, the narrative about Josh Allen's career, it's at risk of being swallowed up by the same unfortunate monster that ate up career narratives of so many others. Bringing a great hand to the table, you got four of a kind with aces but the other dudes got a royal flush. Just ask Philip Rivers about Tom Brady or Dan Marino about Jim Kelly or Jim Kelly about the NFC. But there's still plenty of time because Josh Allen is just 27 and Peyton Manning was 30 the first time that he beat Tom Brady in the playoffs. And once that glass ceiling was shattered, he never lost to Brady in the postseason again. And never forget, John Elway had a losing record in the playoffs until he beat none other than the Kansas City Chiefs in the division around at 37 years old. Now let's just hope for Bills fans sake that they don't have to endure another decade of kicks going wide right before Josh Allen is able to do the same. But let's get back to Patrick Mahomes. Six years as a starter, six AFC championship games, a 13 and three record with 38 touchdowns to only seven interceptions. And the dude is sixth all time in playoff wins. And if he wins the Super Bowl this year, he will be second and it's only six years starting. At this point, you have to wonder if Andy Reid would have put Mahomes in the game as a rookie when Alex Smith 21 to three halftime lead over Marcus Mariota and the Titans started to slip away. He might have seven AFC championship appearances in seven years. Try to tell me now that we are witnessing the greatest of all time at work. Now, this isn't meant to be a shot or disrespect Brady because if Brady is your guy I get it nobody's won more 35 playoff wins seven Super Bowls that's absolutely insane you should absolutely enjoy that title of GOAT while it lasts because just like Tom Brady came for Joe Montana's throne Patrick Mahomes is on his way but unlike Montana versus Brady, where there wasn't a noticeable skill difference, you'd have to be insane to deny the fact that Patrick Mahomes is a better athlete with a better arm. 
And the thing that Brady fans will always come back to is that Brady, they beat Mahomes twice in the playoffs. Dude, Mahomes was in the beginning of his career. And you're going to absolutely need to cling to that if Mahomes finds a way to win his third Super Bowl at age 28 with objectively his worst supporting cast and running through MVP Lamar Jackson on the road along the way. Because Mahomes already publicly stated that Tom Brady set the model for his personal aspirations by playing at a high level until he's 45 years old. Do I think that type of longevity is possible? I don't know. But even if Patrick Mahomes only plays half as long as Brady's career was as a starter, he's still on pace to be top 12 all time in passing yards and touchdowns. Imagine what the stats and records will look like if he's able to double the career length like Tom Terrific did and make it until the year 2040. Because records are made to be broken and bars are set so high that those with the will, imagination, and the right support system can try to clear them. Now, don't make the mistake that people in the generation before me made, dismissing Michael Jordan in the early 90s because Magic Johnson spent the 80s collecting rings. Everybody should just enjoy the greatness while it's right in front of them. Well, everybody except you, Josh Allen, because I know you're not appreciating that in back to the drawing board but that's enough nfl for right now we got to get to our guest head coach for the oregon ducks mr dan lanning and now we're joined by oregon head coach mr dan lanning dan thanks for coming on the show man george thanks for having me all right so i want i want to go back way way back so you're a north kansas city kid what was life like for young Dan Landing in middle school, high school? Well, I grew up loving sports. I'm actually from a really small town outside of North Kansas. I'm, I'm, I'm from a t town called Richmond, Missouri. It's like 5,000 people. So uh, small town, man. Both my parents were teachers. Uh, my grandpa had a farm. So we kind of grew up out in, uh, on a gravel road uh, out there, but grew up loving sports and uh Got to have some great coaches, but that's that's probably where it all started for me. You know, I, I was the guy that did them all. I did baseball, basketball, football. Um, and was lucky to be in a place that uh, was a great place to grow up. Now I want to fast forward to 2011. You are a high school coach, and you decide you got a wife, <laughs> you, you got a kid, she's pregnant, and you decide to make a 13-hour drive to Pittsburgh on a leap of faith what what was going on with that 13 hour drive when you were trying to get a job yeah i mean so to, to be honest i was an elementary PE teacher as a high school football coach and i just had this hunger to do something maybe at a little bit higher level to get a little bit more entrenched in football i didn't know really where that would be but for you know for about three years i was trying to get my foot in the door and anybody that's tried to get into coaching realizes how hard it really is to get your foot in the door and uh you know, I, I finally got in a bite. I'd gotten a phone call that said, hey, we might we might have a job for you. We'll call you back. And they never called back. Um, and one of my big things is you never want to live you know, life with regrets. So the fact that they called, that was enough of a, of a foot in the door that made me want to get in that car and drive 13 hours after I got done teaching class that day and running the weight room um, and got in the car and drove out there. And, and the whole time I'm trying to prep myself for what I might say because I didn't have an interview set up. Uh, I didn't have an opportunity set up, but I just want to get there and see if I can, you know, make, make a run at it. So you get there and the coaches aren't even there. They're off doing something else. What, what was the waiting game like the next day? And did you even think that they would see you? So I get right, right before I get to the facility, I pull over to a gas station. I put a suit on. It's early in the morning because I drove through the night. Uh, so I'm waiting in the lobby. It's like 6 a.m., 7 a.m. I don't know how I got in the door, honestly. Um, but eventually a GA comes up the stairs. His name's Eric Thatcher. He works for the 49ers now. And he's like, yeah, all the coaches, they're in Happy Valley. They're doing a coaching clinic. Um, so I actually hung out the rest of the day with him. Uh, There's a secretary there that didn't want to share uh, the defensive coordinator's number with me. So I, I, <laughs> I think once she realized, like, no, I drove 13 hours. I'm going to wait till I get to talk to somebody. Um, she got me on the phone with the defensive coordinator, Keith Patterson. And uh, I found out he was going to be back the next day. So got a hotel room, uh, stayed the night and, and got to visit with him. And yeah, that was the beginning. So got got offered a job for 800 bucks a month. I think that's back when they called that quality control. I don't know what it is now, but that was uh, that was the first uh, that was the first stab at college coaching. 
And what was that com- conversation with your wife like when you're like, hey, baby, I know that we got a stable income right here, but uh, I'm going to go back to 1200 You know what's crazy? My wife has always been on board. She's always known kind of my dreams and aspirations. And I still I still have the voicemail saved on my phone from Coach Saban calling and uh, offering me an opportunity there in uh, Alabama. And, I, you know, we, I, we sat in my living room there in Huntsville, Texas, and I think we played that voicemail like 15 times. <laughs> And she's like, you can't say no to Nick Saban. And she was right. I couldn't. That was a, an opportunity I couldn't pass up. So I've been lucky to have, you know, Sophia has been a great support this, this entire track. You know, obviously your name has been mentioned with all sorts of coaching jobs, Texas A&M, Alabama. What has made you want to stay at in Eugene, knowing that in the coaching world and out in, you know, out in the world, people are like Alabama, uh, Georgia, and Texas, and that these are the places that you're supposed to want to be at. Yeah. One is because I think we can make Oregon that place. Um, I truly believe everything's in place here for this to be um, as good a coaching job and as good of a a university uh, as there is in college football. Um, I, I think that exists right here in Oregon. And then two, you know, Oregon took a chance on me, right? And who would I be to, to come here, have some success, and then ride off into the sunset whenever uh, they said, you know what, Dan, we trust you with our program. We're going to pour everything we have into you being successful. Uh, I'm not going to leave that. That's, that's you know, I recognize the risk that they took to get me here. And, and I've heard you say before that the job's not finished. Uh, what is the job? To, to make Oregon, you know, the best job in college football, um, you know, I've got goals and aspirations, just, you know, no bones about it. We want to win championships here. Um, and I think the things that we're building are putting us in position to be able to do that. So uh, when will the job be done? I, you know, I don't know when, you know, there's always, you know, I think people that want to grow and people that are successful, they're always looking for a way to improve. So even if a championship comes at some point for us here, I, I don't know that I'll feel like it's done then either. You know, it's, if you can make it better, there's an opportunity to keep continue to improve. Well, that's good news. <laughs> um, as a football coach, you have to compete. You got to compete for recruits. You got to compete for wins. You got to compete to keep your staff. And you had to watch your wife compete in what was her biggest battle, which was a cancer battle. What did you learn from watching her fight that fight? Well, yeah, probably the first thing I learned was football is not that important. And uh, that was a good reset that I needed in my life. You know, at this point, I've been chasing a lot of opportunities. I've been, um, you know, ambitious. And, you know, whenever you find out your wife's sick, the only thing you're worried about is her being healthy and, and your, your three boys having a mom. And that was a really good reset for me. Um, you learn how many people care about you and care about you more than just as a football coach, too. I had a, a great uh, group that supported me, you know, during that time, supported our family during that time. But when you're sitting in the hospital and your wife's getting chemotherapy on Valentine's Day, that puts things in perspective for you. And uh, it's it's something that I hope nobody ever gets to experience. But I'll say this, like through that adversity, it made our family stronger. And you have a tattoo of your wife's face. <laughs> and it has a bunch of uh, little itty bitty tattoos of all your stops. You know, it's got Alabama, it's got Georgia, it's got Oregon and, and everybody in between. What was the impetus for that tattoo? I always joke around my wife. I was like, I like, I like gals that have tats, but I know Sophia's never going to have one. I like, how would I get a tattoo? And it was kind of a surprise to her. I came home that day with it, and she's like, I can't believe you did this. But our journey, you know, that's like it's our story. That's, that's part of what's made this adventure so fun for us. So I just want to get something that maybe kind of symbolized, you know, where we've been, uh, what we've experienced to get here. And, um, you know, that, that journey's not over with. But that was, that was kind of the inspiration for that. So we we don't see the tattoo when you're in your in your your coaching gear and all of that. Where is the tattoo? Yeah, I was hoping nobody I was hoping nobody would ever see that tattoo, but somehow it hit the light of day and it became everybody else's tattoo. So <laughs> I got it on my side. I'll tell you this: the tattoo artist asked me before I got it. He was like, "Do you want to get this numbing cream?" And I'm like, "No, man, I'm good." About halfway <laughs> through, about halfway through, I'm like, "I'm an idiot. I should have." Give me whatever you got because I was about to walk out of there with a side, like a side piece about half of my wife's body on there. I, I, I was almost done. It, it hurt. 
Hey, that's funny because my, my my son who's seventeen, he just dropped him off at college, and he's like, "Dad, I want to get a tattoo." He wants to get it on his side too. He wants to get a whole Bible verse, everything. Let me talk to I was him like, first. <laughs> <"Yeah>, <laughs> better get that number cream. Fast forward, you are at the national championship, hanging out in the suite with Michael Jordan, Jeter, uh, Travis Scott, everybody else. What was that like? Yeah, it's, it's those moments you got to pinch yourself and say, how the heck did I end up here? Like, I hope they don't realize I'm in this room. I'm not the guy that's supposed to be in this room. <laughs> but um, it's part of what Oregon, you know, that's part of what opportunities that Oregon can provide, not just, you know, me as a coach, but our, our players that come here. I think you start to realize the doors that Oregon opens up, you know, for people and the opportunity to work around great people that I've been around has created a lot of success and opportunity for me. So when you can maximize those opportunities, you know, it's amazing what God will put in front of your life. Was there a moment or something that happened when you guys were at the suite that that you can share with us that that you remember? There's a lot that I remember that suite. I'll tell this: I was I was visiting with Michael about a recruit that we we're trying to get, um, trying to sign it as a, a D lineman um, from his neck of the woods, and he's like, "Come on, man, you got to let me have one of them come, you know, <laughs> North Carolina." It's like, sorry, not the, not this one. <laughs> so uh, we uh, it, it's fun being around those guys, you know. You hang on to every word, right? When you hear when you hear people like uh, MJ speak or Jeter speak, you know that's it's a pretty unique opportunity to say the least. I like that. You, hey man, it must must be nice on a first name basis with uh, Mike. Oh man, it's just MJ. It's just MJ. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. It ain't quite like that. What advice would you give to a younger the the younger Dan Lanning or the you know, the 15 year old, the 21 year old that's saying, I want that. I want that life. Just keep chasing your dream. Make make sure you're doing something that you're passionate about. You know, I think it's harder and harder for younger, um, you know, younger kids and younger people in the world because you get so much of your uh, internal, the way you feel about yourself internally from yep. outside noise and ignoring that outside noise. I think it's louder than it's ever been. Um, if you're doing something right, you're going to have haters. That's, that's the reality and ignore that. Keep your head down and focus on the main goal. You know, that's, that's what I would tell myself. I, so I heard about something and I know that you're big on loyalty and, and I heard about this group chat that you've had with your, with your friends that you've had for a very long time and that you are actually the one that plans your, uh, you, you guys as guys trip every single year. You did some digging, man. I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, we got a uh, we got a crew. We go on a we go in, in somewhere different every year. Um, it's a lot of fun to stay connected. You know, um, my friends are my friends. They'll always be my friends. And uh, we got a group that's really, really tight, really, really close. We got a buddy this year that you know is in our group that's getting married in Miami. So the trip this year is going to be down in Miami. So pray for me. And and I know that you love movies too. What are your favorite movies? Uh, top five movies for me, uh, Road to Perdition, Departed, Seven, uh, Last of the Mohicans, oh, Mystic River, Mystic River, that's that's another top five. So they're all kind of depressing hmm. drama movies. Like, you know, some people give me a hard time. I don't have like Wedding Crashers in there. I love that movie, but that's not a, my top five, it's got to be artistic, man. It's got to have yeah. a story behind it. She's stage five clinger. <laughs> I love Wedding Crashers. And you guys, he's head coach of the Oregon Ducks, Dan Lanning. And uh, we'll have him back in just a minute for right or wrong. But first, we got to take a lunch break. So I decided to take the kids to where? Where, where are we going? Fresh and meaty burger. Let's see what these burgers talking about. The Mick is right here and he's not letting me go. McDonald's, you, <laughs> McDonald's where you can go here? Roman, are you excited? Yeah, I'm gonna get a McDonald's. <laughs> Roman, which, which burger do you want? This one. Yeah? Yeah. So here's what the burger comes with. Standard options, the relish joint, tomatoes. I, I'm getting all of this, except for the relish, but, and then we got, oh yeah. Ooh, options too, the chili peppers. So my pops used to tell me about this place, about Fresh and Meaty Burger, so I'm actually juiced because you're gonna see if pops know what he's talking about. Yeah, you feel me? Let's start with the front. What? Oh Lord. Did you just spill the ketchup? Come on, bro. Oh, okay, we gotta wait. So now let's try this again with the fry. 
You want the ketchup? How is it? It's good. It could be a little crispier, but. How is the, are they real fries or are they the frozen fries? No, they're real. Okay, so here's how the fries look. Nice seasoning on them, got a little crisp on. Mm, seasoning nice on them, got a little peppery joint on it too. I like them, teeny tiny bit crispier, but they've been in the bags just for a second. So wrap that joint up in the foil. Look, cause who gotta look good too. Okay. Just more ketchup, huh? Daddy. Take a first bite of a King Burger. How's the meat? Can't see me, Dad. It's good. Is it seasoned well? Can't see me, Dad. Yeah. What would the, you rate it from one to I ten? I want the fries. Like, Can get the eight? fries, Dad? Eight? Dad, I yeah. want the fries. You want some fries? Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm going to get this. Mine obviously has more accoutrements on it. So let's see what he's talking about. I need to get, I need to get, I need to get the fly. First thing you notice is burger season well. You got a nice crust Dad. on it. How's it going, Roman? I'm getting you some fries. Dad. Yes. I want the fries. Okay. You got a good crust on it. And a good amount of mayo, mustard on it, which well, like, do what you have. Dad, just a little more lettuce it. and tomato, because I like Dad, that hot spaghetti. and cold on like a traditional burger. Dad. It's just me, but it's good. Yeah, solid. I'm gonna give this fresh and meaty burger. Give it a 8.2, 8.2 out of 10. Love it. And the fries, they're seasoned really well. I do want just a little more crisp on them. You, you too, Katie? Yeah. They're just a little bit more crisp. If you have fresh fries, you're always going to get uh, higher marks than, than something coming out of the bag. Just, just saying. And now we're back with head coach of the Oregon Ducks, Mr. Dan Lanigan. Now it's time for Rice or a Raw. All right, let's do it. The best Matt Damon movie franchise is the Ocean series, like Ocean 11, 12, 13, and not the Bourne series. Wrong. Yeah, I mean, look, Ocean's Eleven's the lead, right? But after that, they, they take a hard fall, I feel like, you know, so uh, Born, Born's got to be above that. I heard that you love karaoke. So, <laughs> right... <laughs> I don't know about love. I'll participate. I enjoy watching other people sing karaoke, that's for sure. Okay, so right through or wrong, Dan Lanning's go-to karaoke song is Don't Stop Believing. Wrong. Clarence Carter, man. That's that's the, that's the go-to. <laughs> <laughs> that see you surprising with the movies and everything else. Reister or wrong? Dan Lanning knows how to cook a good steak. Reister. Yeah, I can cook a steak. I I, I think I got some uh, flack about how I was doing my steak the other day when I did an Instagram video. They don't realize I was just setting the steak down in the pan. Like <laughs> you sear it over here, there was a resting pan. I normally would do it outside. It was a chilly day in Eugene. I love doing it on the grill. I love doing it outside on the grill. But I can, I mean, I, I can cook a steak. Okay. The problem is I like my steak. I like my steak like rare or medium rare and everybody else in the family is more of a medium. So yeah. you gotta take it another notch up for everybody else. All right, now, now, now for the competition part of the question. Um, so, people were on you about your steak, and people were on Lincoln Riley about his brisket. So, who can make a better brisket, Dan Lanning or Lincoln Riley? If we're competing, man, I'm going to compete to win, man. I'm going to compete to win. I'm sure. I'm sure since that moment, you know, uh, Lincoln. Lincoln can, can, I'm sure he can throw down. Um, I'll say this, we're, we're probably both better coaches than we are cooks. Well, that's good news. Reister or wrong? I was born in Memphis, lived there till, you know, I was nine years old. Um, Memphis barbecue is better than Kansas City barbecue. Wrong, wrong. <laughs> There's some good Memphis barbecue, man, but I got to take you on a, on a uh, barbecue crawl in, in Kansas City at some point. We got to go in. Arthur Bryant's, Joe's, Jack Stack. We got some places to go, man. All right, cool. I'm I'm absolutely down. Um, right or wrong? You knew back in 2011 that Aaron Donald was going to be an all-time great when you guys were at Pitt. Right, sir. 
this dude was a beast, man. In practice, uh, he was really, uh, he was really quite a quiet away from the field. But on the field, this dude was an animal, and he was an animal back then in 2011. Pitt. He, you know, good story. He actually broke our scout team quarterback's collarbone in practice Jeez. one day because he hit him so hard. So, Aaron can play. He can play back then. Obviously, can play now. Yeah, and it was a scout team quarterback, so he didn't get kicked out of practice. <laughs> no, he, he, exactly. exactly. You weren't kick, you weren't kicking that guy out of practice anyway. Right or wrong? Here is the order for the person that you want to get your ass chewed by the least: Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, Todd Graham, and then uh, Mike Norvell. Wrong. I say uh, the best. The guy that gave the best ass chewing is Todd Graham. He was he was like far and away the best Kirby <laughs> Kurt and Kirby was really good at it too I mean I they're all elite like let's all put them in the high category but Mike Mike uh Mike will be at the bottom of the list um but at the end of the day when you're doing your job right you don't want to get ripped by any of them so I was lucky enough to get I get all of them to rip me at some point that's what you need as a young coach and uh certainly enjoyed that experience but I got I got coach Graham there at the top he was the best at it Right or wrong, Dan Lanning, head coach of the Oregon Ducks, is the best head coach recruiter in the nation. Wrong. No, there's always somebody better out there. That's what makes this game fun, man. You got to go compete. There's somebody doing it better than you. You got to figure out a way to be better than them. Well, you guys, that's right or wrong, and he's Coach Dan Lanning. Uh, coach, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it, George. Have a good one. You did some research, man. You made that fun. If you grew up a sports fan and you're over the age of 30, that means that Sports Illustrated probably played an important role in your life. Because making the cover of Sports Illustrated was to athletes what Rolling Stone was to musicians. It was like the Holy Grail. And a Sports Illustrated cover carried with it both a tremendous honor and a massive pressure to live up to your billing as a current or future star. And this week with the news that Sports Illustrated was in the process of laying off its entire staff, a flood of people's favorite covers great social media because 10 or 15 years ago it would have been hard to imagine a world where sports illustrated was going out of business like blockbuster toys r us radio shack when sports have never been more popular i still remember the heartbreak of the july 26 2004 cover showing the breakup of kobe and shack even though i was happy that they chose kobe and one of my all-time favorite covers i didn't know it at the time but i realized that when i got in the league was may 11th 98 showing the chicago bulls gambling with Michael Jordan on the team playing because I remember doing that when I got in the league and it just felt nostalgic. Let me know which SI cover means the most to you in the comments. So because of this news, nostalgia was at an all-time high, but so was the nonsense. Now, if you were scrolling on the timeline, you'd see one person waxing poetic about the improbability of LeBron James living up to being dubbed as the chosen one back in 2002, followed by several brain-dead posts about Sports Illustrated going bankrupt for being too woke because they wouldn't keep putting the women your dad found attractive on the swimsuit edition cover. Simple and incorrect is all always an easier stance than taking what's complex and correct. But if you're willing to hang with me for a couple of minutes here, I'll show you what being woke isn't what killed Sports Illustrated. Primarily because you can't kill something that's already been dead for nine years. What made Sports Illustrated great was the pictures. And before somebody clips this post and posts it with the caption, George, you can't read, bruh. Come on now, <laughs> I can read. But seriously, the best action photographers in the world work for Sports Illustrated, and they captured some of the most incredible images that we've ever seen. It's what put the Illustrated in Sports Illustrated, and it's what set SI apart from the competition. Whether it was Walter Ewells Jr. snagging a photo of Dwight Clark making the catch, or Neil Leifer's photograph of Ali knocking out Sonny Liston, which is one of my personal favorites, because he only did like that for just a quarter second. Or the time Leifer put a camera in the rafters to capture Ali's knockout of Cleveland Williams, the magazine set the standard in photography for 60 years. But in 2015, Sports Illustrated gave in to the Times and let its last six staff photographers go. And from then on, SI used freelancers and pulled still shots from the HD video streams. And I'm not disparaging the talent of freelance photographers, but it would be a lot like your favorite band firing its lead singer, still going on tour and just using the best local karaoke singer in each town. It technically might still be your favorite band and the vocals might be good. It might even be better than the original, but it's not the original, is it? 
No. And then in 2018, Sports Illustrated was sold off by Time Incorporated to Meredith Corporation, who then sold it off to Authentic Brands Group. And then all of a sudden, the entire appeal of Sports Illustrated wasn't to do the game-changing work of the past. It was to operate under a licensing agreement by a company called The Maven. The Maven, which is now called The Arena Group, was started by the same dudes, Ross Levinson and Jim Heckman, that literally ran the recruiting behemoth, Scout.com, into the ground. That is until the good and decent people at CBS 24-7 swooped in to rescue them from bankruptcy for pennies on the dollar. So for the last few years, the Arena Group has paid Authentic Brands a licensing agreement to publish online articles under the Sports Illustrated name. And the physical magazine went from being weekly to monthly publication, and the online focus became team-specific sites, much like Scout.com, which you remember from earlier, went bankrupt. So you had a company operating under an nostalgic brand name for a few years while constantly hemorrhaging employees. And then in January of this year, the Arena Group misses a $3.75 million licensing payment to the authentic brands for the right to pretend to be Sports Illustrated. Now, if you remember our earlier analogy, we've reached the point where now the karaoke singers that are now paying to be in the band just ran out of cash. And whatever is out there wearing Sports Illustrated clothes and pretending to be the company that you used to love just ran out of gas. And unfortunately, that means there are some good writers that do some good work like Pat Forty or Matt Verderam that might need to find another gig. And it's sad and inevitable, but times change. Because the same internet that makes all of our Sports Illustrated memories going back to the 1960s constantly accessible made the vehicle that delivered most of those memories obsolete. The way we consume content has changed. I mean, that's why you're here on YouTube or social media watching me here instead of on terrestrial television. And I'm grateful to have your time and energy. But as hard as it is to imagine, one day YouTube might be on the chopping block as well if they don't adapt. So is Sports Illustrated dead because they went woke? No. They died nine years ago in large part because print media is leaving this earth at the same rate as the boomer generation. So we've had the last decade of SI karaoke and while karaoke is cool and fun and sometimes it's very, very good, it's not the real thing. So let Sports Illustrated go. Or if you got the cash, you can pay authentic brands a few million dollars a year just to pretend to be Sports Illustrated too. Let that sink in. It's fatherhood time, so bring it in for the real thing. Now, I have five kids, 23, 17, 13, 12, and four. So I have all sorts of things come up, but this one is specifically about the 17 and the 23 year old because they have had some car issues. And these are things that if you are a parent, you're gonna wanna send to your kid because you're gonna be like, see, look, I'm not the only one. And, or if you are falling in that demo, then this is for you. Number one, Check your tires regularly, at least every couple weeks. Take a quarter down into the little groove of the tire. See if it's about halfway up. If it is, you're good. If not, then you need to start to think about when you're gonna get some new tires or preparing for it over the next couple weeks or months or however much time that you really have. And also look on the inside of the tire because if you, you probably haven't had an alignment or had your tires rotated recently, so they're probably not wearing evenly and you can get them balding on the inside while it's still looking good on the outside and you're primed for a blowout and a potential accident. Do not let this happen. I've seen it with my kids already. Number two, oil changes and scheduled maintenance. If you have a new car or you have a warranty policy, make sure that you are doing that. Your scheduled maintenance where they're changing all the fluids and checking everything that's covered in your warranty. But if not, just make sure that you are getting your oil changes for the love of God please. So then the question is, how do you know? How do I know if I need an oil change? Look in your car's manual or hit on YouTube. I have a 2021 Accurate Legend or I have a 2023 Ford Focus, whatever it is. How long do I need to go between oil changes? And they will tell you. It could be 5,000 miles, 10,000 miles, 20, depending on the type of car that you have, but get them done. Cause you don't want your engine locking up, you pulling over the side of the road, black smoke going up. That's a four to $5,000 problem that could have been avoided by a 40, $50 oil change. Number three, if you get a parking ticket or you, especially if you were in college, listen, that those parking tickets are going to catch up with you. 
You, you can't run away with them. You are not going to be able to get your diploma. You're not going to be able to register for classes, any of that. And if you aren't in school, your registration or your license is going to get held up because you didn't pay your parking tickets or your speeding tickets or, or traffic infractions. Take care of them on the front end because what's a $150 ticket on the front end will turn into a six, $700 ticket when it goes to collections. You know how I know? Because I had it happen when I was playing in the NFL like a young dummy. Number four, your windshield wipers. If you live in a place where the seasons change regularly, where it gets super hot one part of the year, super cold, your windshield wipers are not going to last an entire year. They're only going to last about half of a year. And you need to prepare for that before it rains because windshield wipers aren't that expensive. Just make sure that they that you change them because you do not want a bad situation on the day that it does pour down and you're driving and you're like, oh my God, I can't see with these windshield wipers. Don't do it. It's a safety issue. And number five, this one, I had to learn the hard way and I had to tell my kids the exact same thing. Thank God it hasn't happened to them and I hope that they are either listening or doing this. Do not leave valuables in plain sight. I'm an idiot. I left my window open. Someone took a bite on my burrito. Ugh, I really hate ba Bakersfield. Like do not leave your car and leave a bag on the front seat in the back seat, anything, put it on the floor, put it in the trunk. And yes, I know people are out here in Atlanta, San Francisco and everywhere else cracking in trunks and cars that are parked, but do not give a window shopper an opportunity where they weren't even trying to window shop. Don't do it. I had this happen to me because my rookie year, Fred Taylor, who's been a guest on the Unafraid Show, gave all the linemen and tight ends, gave us nice Louis duffel bags, the little brown joint. It was my first Louis. I was excited. I took. He gave it to us on, on Saturday morning. I took it on the trip with us when we left Saturday afternoon, put my nice new Jordan Concords in there, a toiletry bag. And man, I'm feeling fresh, boy. I'm like, bro, I'm feeling like I'm a first Louis. We fly back from the game. And we, and we leave straight from the airport and we go to this club. I left my bag sitting right on the front seat. And you know what? When we came out of the club, window shattered. Everything, bag gone. I learned the hard way so you don't have to. So make sure you send this to your kids or you don't do these things, kids, please. And now back to ball. Last up on the Unafraid Show, we need to talk about somebody that was truly unafraid to be themselves this week, and that's Mr. Jason Kelsey. This dude was at the Bills Chiefs game in Buffalo, loving and supporting his brother Travis like nobody was watching. And I never, I repeat, I never thought I would see the day when an NFL center was a media darling because they don't get press like that. But between the New Heights podcast that Jason hosts with his brother Travis, that's number one in podcast, his Christmas album, the Amazon documentary that followed him through the last season, and the fact that he somehow beat me, me, out for the 2023 People Magazine Sexiest Man of the Year nomination, the dude is having a pretty good run. And yes, we're talking about Jason, not Travis, Taylor Swift's boyfriend. Now, last week with the Eagles out of the playoffs and Jason Kelsey rumored to be done playing football, we got to watch the man cut loose in Buffalo. And I am confident in saying that Jason Kelsey isn't the first or even the millionth man in the history of Buffalo, New York, to drink out of a bowling ball and then walk around outdoors in nothing but a pair of Russell athletic sweats and some Timberlands tied up real tight. And this dude's a multimillionaire, but he's definitely got to be the first one to do it while hanging out with Taylor Swift. Side note, I saw the thousands and thousands of you complaining about shots of Taylor Swift after every play of the Chiefs games, but to all of the dads and moms in America curled up on the couch with their daughters last weekend who don't normally watch football and they were tolerating the game in between watching their kid light up during the shots of Taylor Swift, I see you. But don't let these grouches out there steal your joy. But back to Jason Kelsey though. Do you know how good it must have felt to, for him to just be a fan? To let loose and support his brother like that? Football locker rooms can be like a family. Just ask them kids who were staying at Arizona after Jed Fish left. And when I put my pads on, it really felt like I was going to war with my brothers. As good as that feels though, that type of family is no replacement for your flesh and blood. You could see that bond in the way that Jason was rooting on Travis. And to be honest, if Jason really is done playing, I admire and love the fact that he got to go out on his own terms with a Sugar Bowl appearance, a Super Bowl ring, seven Pro Bowls, 
and his health because not all of us get to decide when we're done because the game usually decides for us just like it did for me but whether you get to hang up your own cleats or the game hung them up for you there's nothing like falling back in love with your sport as a fan of the game when i finished playing i went through the depression of being done like everybody else does because something that you put your blood sweat and tears into for so long so for the majority of your life by that point is over and it's done and I couldn't watch the NFL for years because I knew I could still play, but my neck betrayed me. Even though I couldn't watch the league, I still could watch college and high school football because I love football. And now over a decade later, when I'm out as a dad and I'm watching my kids or my nephew, I'm a fan at that point and it's a different feeling. Now, there are things that I've loved to see, like getting to watch LeBron James in person, supporting Bryce and Bronny on the basketball court like he was a normal dad. You get to see a different side of him, and no, he wasn't on the sideline crushing beers, shirtless and sweats and Timberlands, at least not yet though. But everybody is different. Cause something about unconditionally rooting for other people makes your true colors come out and all the branding and veneer and professionalism they go out the window and at the end of the day you get to be yourself and i bet sunday was one of the best days of jason kelsey's life and i'm grateful he was unafraid enough to share it with the rest of us and that's the unafraid show thank you guys for your time make sure that you like subscribe get notifications and tell a friend about the show because sharing will help us continue to grow bring you great guests great segments and everything in between and next week we got greg mcelroy in the building college football analyst champion over there at alabama crimson tide and we gotta get into it peace out